Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you to DG Radio and to Ursa for inviting me. Thank you for all of you for being here on a Friday afternoon. Huh? And uh, I'm really pleased to be here, not only because I am in a very, let's say, friendly environment. As Peter said, I have been working with uh, DG Radio for um, in many occasions but especially because I managed to arrive here. Uh, and this was uh, something that I could not expect to do uh, even two or one day uh, ago. So it means that the situation in Brussels is a little bit improving and I am really pleased about that. <coughs> so going to the lecture, so I'm sorry that I have to leave, but these are the circumstances. Um, going to the lecture. So the idea is to tell you something about a research program, uh, not a project, it's a program that we are developing at Politecnico since 10 years uh, at least. So I am speaking, but the work has been done by a team. Uh, and some, the names are there, Roberto Camagna, Andrea Caraglio, uh, Ugo Fratesi. And uh, we, ha have, uh, we are a very uh, small team, but very dynamic because the work behind what I'm going to show you is very, very big. Uh, the program, the research program, is to build uh, scenarios. Uh, um, what are scenarios? What will, do we mean by scenarios? But first of all, scenarios are neither uh, forecasts nor foresights. Forecasts, as you all know, are precise values of something that will happen in a short term. Uh, what the GDP will look like in six months, in maximum one year. Uh, these are forecasts. And you come up with a precise value. The opposite are foresights. And foresights are images of the future. Uh, and in, generally, in general, these images are built on a disruptive uh, event. Uh, uh, technolo a technological change, uh, something like a, an economic uh, um, a new situation that provides new worlds. And sometimes the uh, four sites are built on ideas that, on these um, unplausible, not plausible ideas. Uh, let's say if we invent the flying cars, what our cities will look like, for example. This is a foresight. Mm. Scenarios are in between, mm. in the sense that we are not giving you precise values of the future, uh, but we, and we do not provide you with unplausible, um, with the images of unplausible situations. What we are providing, we are trying to build, are um, images of what, in this case, our European territory would look like under some plausible uh, assumptions on some driving forces of change. There is not only one driving force, there are many of them, and this is the problem of the scenarios. This is the difficulty in building scenarios because these driving forces have to be linked together in a very coherent way. And with, by linking the, the, the driving forces, you build the scenario. But it will become clearer by going on. Uh, this is a, a work that we did in ESPON. So in, uh, the results are uh, well, the, the, the exercise was run in 2013, uh, so it's already a little bit old. We then run other scenarios in the Greenco project, but this is more of interest for, uh, for DG Regio because it's more related to cohesion policies. Uh, we built quantitative scenarios, so you will see numbers, you will see figures, but these figures are not to be interpreted as precise values. They give tendencies. They give behavioral tendencies of some events, of some aspects. Huh? And the quantitative side of the exercise is uh, due to our MUST model, which we built our, on our, uh, our own on um, 10 years ago, and we revised it 
and we are now on the third version of it. Um, the model is able to do many things, not all of course, uh, and we are very aware of that. But for example, it's very good in simulating effects on the regional growth of, for example, the economic crisis in terms of its duration, uh, uh, how long it will uh, last. That's a very important aspect. All the macroeconomic elements, uh, like the budget constraints, public budget constraints, sovereign debt, uh, spread uh, in interest rates on public bonds, exchange rates, all these are levers of the model. We can change them uh, in, in a very, let's say, coherent way, and we can get uh, uh, results out. And then at the local level, we have all what we call the territorial capital assets that are the elements, uh, the structural elements that characterize each territory, each region. It's NUTS2, because MASTER is uh, built at NUTS2 level. Um, which means innovativeness, uh, trust, uh, agglomeration economies, human capital, and so again, all these are levers of the model. We can change it and get something out of it. And then we have cohesion and infrastructure policies. Um, so how does, just briefly, how does this work? We start by thinking we have a seminal idea, as we call it, so an idea uh, about how the driving forces of growth uh, will change. Eh? And uh, uh, our, we believe uh, will characterize future economic territorial development. So we do some assumptions, qualitative assumptions. And these qualitative assumptions have to be, let's say, put together in a hormon in an harmonized way and become, and uh, let's say, um, uh, s decide the way in which and the intensity in which these elements will change. And then we translate this qualitative assumption into a quantitative um, uh, measure, uh, which are the levers of the model, and we get the results out of our MAST model. Uh, be uh, just just for you the simulation period runs from 2013 to 2030 we cannot go beyond 2030 with our must model now uh, we would need a crystal ball instead of a uh, so we, we we need to build uh, we we run into four sites uh, if we go beyond uh, something like six, uh, 15 years uh, so that's the maximum we can achieve um, as I said, a scenario is an integrated vision of the different driving forces uh, expected to have effects on future growth trajectories of each uh, regional um, area in Europe. Uh, therefore, uh, the individual driving forces must be strongly related to each other. So otherwise, uh, you don't have a coherent scenario. So you have to build, first of all, the, uh, the relationship between the assumptions and the way in which you move the levers of the model. Especially, you have to be very clear in keeping the if-then logic very separated. So it means the assumptions have to be strongly separated from the output. Otherwise, you run into a tautological uh, reasoning. Uh, um, and the assumptions of the driving forces should be as differentiated as possible, uh, sometimes even opposite to each other, to give some, let's say, ideas, uh, to yield differentiated images, so to provide differentiated images. Now, these are very important aspects that you have to keep in mind. Um, then we started by building what we call a baseline scenario. Mm. And the baseline scenario is the so scenario where uh, it's not an, an extrapolative scenario from the past because we inserted some assumptions, but nothing so much changes uh, with respect to the prevalence and situation. For example, the socioeconomic and demographic trends of the past will continue. So that's, we extrapolate them. Huh? 
uh, and no major change beyond the crisis will alter the EU economy. So the idea is the situation is as it, as it was in 2013 eh, with the crisis and we extrapolate that. Um, the economic policies will remain, it will remain the present ones, uh, stable budget for structural funds and stable macroeconomic policies. So pl please keep this in mind because it's very important given the results that we get. Um, we will have a general slow recovery uh, that will start in 2016. So we were in 2013. Uh, so we imaginated that the crisis could, and this is something that is happening uh, little by little. So we were right mm, in, in 2013. Um, then we imagine it again, we were right, that little by little the competitiveness of European countries uh, increases uh, in terms of export capacity. Uh, so Europe will little by little increase up to 2030 its export capacity. Um, interest rates on bond. Again, this is something that it sounds very simple now, but in 2013, we were under strong speculative attacks. Uh, and we uh, assumed that these would have stopped uh, uh, and go little by little to the pre-crisis values. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a NB there. Um, the assumptions were agreed in December 2011. So we started with the assumption in 2011. We uh, revisited them after the Draghi's intervention uh, in to keep the speculation down, in which took place in, in July, September 2012. And uh, uh, the final conditional quantitative source foresight have been run in early 2013. Uh, what is important again is that the stability pact remains the same. So we will remain with this uh, pact, uh, imposing highly restrictive fiscal policies to countries that do not have the, um, the, the budget uh, in a, a positive situation. So given these assumptions, which are the uh, which will be the outcome for Europe in 2013. So, first of all, the aggregate results are the following. First of all, we will have the new 12 countries that will still grow above the Western countries, but not at all as they did before the crisis. So uh, the, they, they, they run more than, so sorry, these are, again, the numbers. As I said, this is a GDP growth, annual average GDP growth. Don't take it as a forecast. Uh, it explains the tendency. So it will be positive, it will be, and it's a re relative with respect to, these numbers are very important to, in order to be read in comparison with uh, uh, the different uh, areas. Uh, the second one is that the new 12 countries increase employment in services more than in manufacturing, uh, which means that they are entering what uh, we economists call a new stage of development. So their economies uh, move towards uh, a service economy. And then the Western countries show a balanced growth between manufacturing and services. So instead, this means that in uh, Europe, uh, in Western countries, uh, in industry will grow exactly, uh, exactly uh, in the same, with the same uh, size as the, the service activities. That's at the aggregate level. But what about at the, re at the regional level? And this is the result. So we have it again, if we remain in the situation of 2013 without any policy, mm, uh, different macroeconomic policy, keeping the stability pact, keeping the structural funds as they are in, as they were in 2013, the result is that we end up with a two-speed Europe. Uh, again, southern peripheral countries, the countries grow less than northern countries. Of course, red is higher and blue Blue is zero. Uh, it's not negative, it's zero, or just slightly above zero. So what is striking in this map is that parts of Greece and, well, 
one, one region in, in Spain, um, register, uh, will register in 2030 a zero growth, uh, which means that the, even if the, the, um, the, the crisis stops in 2016, other um, 15, how many, uh, 15, uh, 14 uh, years are not enough to uh, make these uh, regions go back to the competitiveness of the period before the crisis. Uh, overall, international disparities increase. That's found out in terms of colors, uh, uh, different colors within countries. But what is interesting is the following that the baseline scenarios tells us the total regional disparities increase. I know that Lewis was very much, uh, uh, was not pleased, let's say, with that. Uh, but this, there is a reverse tendency of uh, decreasing disparities uh, that we had over the last uh, periods. And this is due not to international disparities. The international disparities still decrease, but they do not decrease enough to compensate the international disparity increases. Uh, so it means that the fact that our Eastern countries uh, do not grow as before uh, with respect to the Western countries means that the total regional disparities register a, an increase. Uh, but then, OK, this is if we keep the situation as it is and so on. But now we play uh, with some imagination on what we call exploratory scenarios. That is to say, what the uh, European territory would look like with different uh, situations. Mm? And the situation has three. So the, the scenarios are uh, in a number of three. The first one is what was called the, during the e in European uh, Territory 2050 uh, uh, project of ESPON, the mega scenario. There are some um, local assumptions. For example, we assume in these scenarios that there is a concentration of investments in European large uh, cities and especially this is also helped by the cohesion policy that concentrates in what uh, the highest, in uh, areas where the highest return of investments lie. That's an assumption. Huh? But there are also other important uh, assumptions at the uh, macroeconomic level. Um, it is a market driven scenario. Uh, which means that we have a welfare system fully privatized. Uh, uh, we have financial debt repaid in 2030. Uh, budget reduced for cohesion policies. It's a market-driven scenario. Uh, so a very, very radical uh, position. And the concentration, as I said, of investments in uh, European large cities. Then we move to another situation, uh, thinking about a possible uh, another situ uh, possible uh, different situation, which is the city scenario. In this situation, public policies are developed mostly at the national level. The actual welfare system is reinforced, and it is paid to, through an increase in taxation. Uh, we have financial debt, which is fully repaid in uh, 2050, so it means that we shift uh, the the, the, the repayment of the financial debt from 2030 to 2050. Uh, the budget maintain, is maintained, for the budget of is man, uh, or the structural funds budget is maintained for the cohesion policies, and there is a concentration of investments in second rank cities in Europe. And then there is another scenario, which is the region scenarios, where this is a social policy scenario. Uh, there is a strong public uh, welfare system paid through debt. Uh, uh, financial debt is not, of course, repaid in 2050, so we go to a very assistential um, uh, system. Uh, and the budget significantly increases for cohesion policies, and there is a concentration of investments in rural and cohesion areas. 
So as you see, these are very radical situations. Uh, we exaggerated in the, uh, making them radical just because they, we had to be sure that they are different. Uh, they differ one another very clearly. Uh, and we run them, we, we put them into a, a, the mass model, uh, and this is uh, the, the outcome, the aggregate outcome. The third three columns are, uh, no, the fourth three columns are the uh, annual average GDP growth uh, in absolute terms, while the last three columns are the megas, the cities, and the region scenario with respect to the baseline. Okay, so that's a comparative term with respect to the situation that we envisage <coughs> of today that we envisage. First of all, what is we did not really expect is that the city scenario is the most expansionary. So the GDP growth mo the most uh, in the city scenario. Uh, and this is a scenario where territorial capital and the urban system uh, of Europe uh, are better exploited than in the other scenarios. So you, you tap the untapped potentials that, uh, that uh, um, second rank cities and uh, uh, see the, the urban systems of second rank cities have. Uh, uh, at least this is how we interpreted it. And this is true, sorry, sorry both in absolute and in, in um, relative terms. Uh, and this holds for the new 12 countries, even if this, what I said, holds also for the new 12 countries, even if uh, to a more limited degree. And here we always have a discussion with our colleagues in Poland. They say, uh, or even also in uh, Hungary, they say, uh, no, our big cities are the ones that need the most, most in, uh, investments because they are, there is a lot of traffic, a lot of congestion. They have suffered from the boom, the economic group boom that have seen a strong concentration of activities going to the capital cities. So we need to have investments in order to cope with these problems. Well, the result is, and they don't want to listen uh, about the idea to uh, strengthen the second rank cities. They have a very, very impressive, very important um, urban uh, rank system, uh, at, sorry, urban uh, system at sec of second rank cities that is really a richness in, that com in those countries. And according to, to these results, this is something that could help them. Um, then the new countries are those that gain in the region scenarios with respect, they are the only ones that gain in the region scenario with respect to the baseline. The old 15 member countries do not gain very much from a social policy point of view. This is at the aggregate level. But of course we have to see what happens at the regional level and especially what comes out in terms of uh, cohesion. Uh, uh, that is to say, um, regional disparities. This is a map that tells you the D GDP growth rate in the mega scenarios with respect to the baseline scenario. So where you have the, the, the red means that the mega scenario grow more than the baseline scenario, where you have the, the blue uh, is that they grow less. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are negative, but they grow less than the baseline scenario. And here is uh, the, the picture that tells us that in uh, Western countries there, is a there are strong advantages for rich and central regions, uh, but, but also countries like Greece, uh, part of uh, Spain, uh, and part of, of central Italy gains, uh, even in a mega scenario. Uh. Um, in the eastern countries, uh, there is r relatively more diffused growth. If you see the colors, uh, they are uh, much less scattered. Uh, they are much of the same color. Uh, and, uh, and this is, we think, thanks to a general recovery of the EU uh, economy uh, that helps these regions to, to grow. This is the same map for the city scenario. And here we have 
that in Western countries there is a more widespread and diffused uh, growth at the international level. Uh, if you see within countries, uh, there, is, there are the same colors within the same countries, more than before, than in the mega scenario. So you have a more widespread uh, uh, development. Then you have strong countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, uh, that increase less than southern countries. Uh, again, but this is uh, not a, a social policy scenario. Uh, this is a competitiveness scenario. The point is that you give emphasis to other elements to, with respect to the mega scenario. And here in Eastern countries, you have diffused advantages, relative less pronounced than in the Western. So the the, here, the Western countries, Poland, so are less uh, red, uh, are, less, uh, are growing less. And then there is a similar increase in growth than in the mega scenario. Well, now the regions uh, scenario, so the more social policy oriented scenario. Um, here we have, of course, many blues, uh, and that's uh, perspective, because this is not a scenario where you uh, look for uh, competitiveness. Uh, so we have central core regions that grow less than in the baseline scenario. Uh, you see France, uh, part of northern Italy, all the, all, uh, the Netherlands and, uh, and this one. But uh, uh, rural and peripheral areas gain relatively more than the, in the baseline scenario, but especially these holes both for Western and for Eastern countries, which is something that we did not expect. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is in terms of growth. Uh, what about in terms of regional disparities? Uh, because of course we have to keep, given these data, uh, these figures, we could f come out with the um, result that the CT scenario is the most expansionary one, so we should go for it. But what about the disparities that we create or we uh, do not decrease? And this is the um, total regional disparities, it's a tile index uh, for the four scenarios. Uh, the blue one uh, with, the, with the triangle is the baseline scenario. Mm? So it means that one scenario, which is the mega scenario, sees a total regional disparity which is higher than the baseline scenario. And this was something that we expected. You go for competitiveness. Huh? But we did not expect that the city scenario, which, is, which lies on assumptions of competitiveness, huh? uh, is lower than the baseline scenario. And of course, the re and it is l even lower than the region scenario, which, is, which means that, and believe me, we did not do anything to get these data out, uh, to these results out. So this is something that if you believe in the model uh, and you put the, the assumptions in, you get it out. And it tells you that the, region, the city scenario is the most expansionary, but is also the, the one in which the regional disparities increase the less. D splitting the two situations of the intra and inter-regional disparities into two, we have these, this is the between country disparities and they decrease in all scenarios, but again, the uh, scenarios that had the lowest, um, in, uh, the highest decrease uh, uh, is the city scenario, while the, the region scenario has the highest uh, uh, decrease. Uh, sorry, the, yes, the highest decrease. Um, in the inside uh, country disparities, so the intra-regional uh, disparities, the situation is the following. We have uh, the region scenario, which is the most uh, cohesive uh, in, in that case, and this is something that uh, come we, we expected. Huh? Uh, there is the mega scenario that is, uh, again, something uh, higher than the baseline, but the baseline and the city are nearly the same. Uh, so it means that the city scenarios in terms of uh, intra regional disparities would not um, deteriorate the present situation. And on the contrary, it would increase the international 
disparity and the, so that the total disparity at the end is the most, uh, uh, the low, uh, disparity is the highest, uh, sorry, the lowest. Mm. Um, then, conclusions. What should we take out of this story? Of course, we uh, run into the debate of the trade-off uh, between competitiveness and cohesion. So we know that uh, there are, of course, two complete uh, opposite, I would say, alternative ways of thinking about cohesion policies. The competitiveness strategies favoring highest return of investment on core, er on core areas, so, so to call them the champions, so to achieve higher aggregate growth rates and obtain higher fiscal revenues on which distributive policies could rely. On the other side, we and this is the, the World Bank vision, then we have a cohesion strategy oriented towards the support of weaker and peripheral regions, favoring equity rather than competitiveness goals. Well, our impression after running this and after some theoretical thoughts is that, our impression at the end, is that the trade-off idea appears as a misleading short-term and old approach to territorial policies. Instead, what we should go for is to go for cohesion via competitiveness, uh, which is something that I'm sure it's not new to you, but we have to find the way, the right way to do that. And the, what we, oh, oh, sorry, the last slide. Uh, the, the last, okay. The, the last slide says that, uh, according to our impression, is that a modern territorial development policy should be designed so as to maximize the returns to public investments. Uh, of course, do more with less, especially when you have uh, a so um, limited amount of public uh, resources. And this is something, again, that you all know. But this goal, how can we achieve this goal? Uh, intervene uh, on bottom uh, bottom up through local actors, uh, depositories of relevant local information. Again, something that you try to do uh, with the smart specialization strategy, for example. Act on the specificities of each single area and push local actors to tap and mobilize previously untapped assets of territorial capital. This is very easy to say. Oh, at least, uh, it's and it's something also that it's in the smart specialization strategy, more or less, uh, but it's there. And the first uh, evaluation that of this strategy can tell you that this is extremely difficult to make local people understand to, that they have to tap and mobilize previously untapped uh, assets of territorial capital is something that is very, very difficult to be uh, uh, perceived in the right way by local policymakers. Um, in this way, of course, as we show and we have shown in the in the scenario uh, building exercise, the aggregate development effects will be maximized. Uh, and th at the same time, the economic and social costs of an unbalanced development process will be kept under control. Well, that was it. Thank you very much for your attention.